made for autistic people, parents and carers of kids on the autism spectrum. This is a different brilliant with Orion Kelly. No two autistic people are the same. Open conversations that inform and engage a better place for autistic An aspect people. podcast focusing on the strengths, interests and aspirations of the autistic community. Welcome to a different brilliant. Thank you so much for listening to A Different Brilliant. I'm your host, Orion Kelly, and I'm autistic. A Different Brilliant is an aspect podcast made for autistic adults and parents or carers of kids on the autism spectrum. My purpose is to inspire, inform, and entertain you through focusing on the strengths, interests, and aspirations of the autistic community. And if you're not autistic but open to learning more, well, I'm so happy to hear that you have come to the right place. Open, honest, and engaging conversations on autism. A different brilliant with Orion Kelly. To learn more, catch up on the episodes, or send us a message. Like the Aspect page on Facebook, or visit autismspectrum.org.au. Now, on this episode, we explore the topic of parenting autistic children, more specifically, positive parenting. My guest is advocate, public speaker, consultant, writer and parent of two autistic kids and one neurotypical kid, Kirsty Russell. Kirsty, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. (laughs) Now, before we get into nitty-gritty stuff, could you share with us a bit about your personal story and your personal connection to autism? Okay, well, like probably many of people who might be listening to this, I really didn't have much of a connection or understanding of autism before I became um, a mum. So um, my son, he'll be 16 next month, which is rather scary. And he was born with a condition called albinism. So he has no pigmentation, his hair, skin and eyes. And that leads to a vision impairment. And so we didn't know for a few years that. So he's also born autistic. Um, and we got that diagnosis when he was four. And then a few years later, um, his sister, when she was six, she was diagnosed with Asperger's at, at that time, sort of under the old DSM. And then since then, I suppose having my children, we've realised that Many members of our family and our social circle are also autistic and some people have gone forward and and, um, got diagnoses or have just sort of self-identified and and that's helped us understand their situation. But it's it's been a big shift in that 16, you know, year period since having my son to sort of, you know, having had no understanding or or any personal connection to suddenly sort of almost having this community of um, autistic family members and friends around us. This is the kind of stuff, uh, hopefully this conversation will help people understand, this is the kind of stuff that people just don't hear about when the attention is focused on autistic people rather than parents and carers or in my instance I'm sure I'm autistic but I'm also a dad can I be both at the same time I mean it's so it's tricky and and, and Mm. there are obvious challenges I know that you know that despite all those potential challenges how important is taking a positive approach to parenting autistic kids and what are some of the ways you and your husband have gone about that well as I've sort of gone along, I think that, you know, and looking back sort of over the, the years that we've been on this journey, I think it's it's vital to have a positive approach. And, and it's very difficult <laughs> to do that in the beginning because when you're going through the diagnosis process and when, you know, you're dealing with with what you see as challenging behaviour and, and, you know, and, and all, of the, all of the challenges of the situation, it's, it's difficult to see any of positives because... That whole process is predicated on you sort of on your child, you know, having particular deficits or, or, you know, not being able to meet the milestones and all those sorts of things. It's going to be really, really difficult in the beginning to see the positives. But I think we need to try and it's very difficult to switch that completely. So I just want to to recognize that. But I think it's also vital that we try and look for the positives because it's the system around us that sees a lot of this in a negative fashion. And so looking at things, looking for the opportunities um, is really the only way to move forward. And I suppose my husband and I have done that in, in a few different ways. You know, we, 
we decided first off to, to ask lots of questions. So if, you know, particular treatments or therapies or specialists were recommended to us, you know, we wanted to understand why and what was the purpose and what was the benefit, I guess. So I didn't want to sort of just go with something because, you know, it was recommended. We really wanted to, to understand that for ourselves. That gave us um, more control and more understanding, which necessarily helps you because it, you know, stops you being consumed by your fears because you've got a little bit of knowledge. Also challenging our own assumptions. So, you know, as I said, that, you know, the media is all about, you know, oh, finding a cure for autism or, you know, they, they'll come up with all the stories about people in, you know, kids in schools and stuff um, and all the negatives. And it's really challenging the assumptions. And for us, it was going, you know, what does autism really mean? And for us, it's, it's our kids. Um, they experience the world in a different way. They engage with the world in a different way. So we just need to, to understand that to try and meet their needs as best we can. So for us, it was really just trying to challenge, is this really bad? No, it's not because my kids, you know, see things differently and, you know, have given us so much insight and so much, you know, valuable perspective for me. And it's also looking at, you know, looking for opportunities. So instead of sort of accepting or thinking that life is going to be difficult, it's sort of going, okay, well, yet there are going to be challenges. But what can we do, you know, to approach those? What can we do to, to make them easier? And so, you know, for instance, we looked at drama classes for our daughter. She expressed some interest, but she also, we thought it would be great for the social skills, you know, and, and to, to help her out. And in fact, she now has this amazing interest and talent for it. So we've been able to sort of to, to find this, to look for the positives, look for an opportunity, and now she's really developing a strength and an interest and, you know, developing a, a group, a social group that, you know, that she wouldn't have had otherwise. So I really think looking more positively and at least being open for the opportunities and open to the fact that, yes, you know, there, there's going to be some good things that come out of this as well is really important for parents. And just as a, as a side note with acting, and autism, depending clearly on the diagnosis, you know, they, they can go hand in hand. I mean, you, you mask all day, you become a pretty good actor. I think we'll, we have actually been acting our entire lives, really, haven't we? So, so the world yeah. will accept us. So it's a really interesting observation. Maybe there's some, yeah. some research there, some examples there. And, and as you say, for me, you are way ahead with regards to your, your lived experience. You know, for my wife and I, our son being six and really mm. a diagnosis only in the last year, Right now, I would say we're in the eye of the storm. We're, I, mean, yes. to be, I don't want this to sound uh, negative or rude, but in all honesty, it's very hard to enjoy our autistic son and our family at the moment. It, it feels like we're just on the front line. It's, you know, war, sleep, war, sleep, war, sleep. Now, when I mean war, I mean it's just a, a blur. It's challenging, and it's an eye of a storm feeling right now, and it's very hard to to look past that when we know we can and he's just started primary school and all reports yeah. is he's doing yeah. phenomenal in a mainstream school. But of course, what do you think happens when he gets home and he's in a safe space and he's been yeah. masking all day? It's even worse than it was before. So the yeah. meltdowns yeah. and the things. So it's for us, that's where we're at. And from your point of view, I know that you help parents and carers of autistic kids find support, introduce positivity into their parenting. Well, I'd love you to talk us through some of those for those listening, and you can count me in as one of those people uh, <laughs> taking notes because it's hard. It is hard, and and that's why sort of what I explained sort of before that this is not something that that I did from the start. Do you know what I mean? So this has been a journey for us, and as I said, we're sixteen years, nearly sixteen years into the journey, and the challenges are different. Um, you know, at the different ages. And that's also why I think it's so important to try and have strategies or to try and find a way forward. So really what, as carers and parents, we really should do, and, and one of the things I was very bad at in the beginning was to prioritise my own needs. Because you do, you you sometimes feel like you're, you've got to be on all the time. And I think that was the, and it's still a bit like that, you know, you've always got to be on guard. There's always that that sense of sort of having to be ready to ready to go at any point in time. And that can be really difficult, particularly sort of over time. And I ended up having a health scare a few years back where, um, well, it, it was like a mini stroke at the time, um, wow. but, it, but it wasn't. It was an atypical migraine, but it was sort of like a mini stroke. It's sort of, I had the left side of my body went numb. And basically, they, they, you know, did a lot of tests and stuff. And they said to me, look, this is stress. You know, your body has just basically had too much. And I was trying to work during the day between school pickup. I wasn't having lunch. Um, I was this particular week when that happened to me. I had attended six different appointments for both the kids. And so it wasn't sustainable. So what I learned from that, and that was after years of being in the eye of the storm, is that you have to, to look after yourself. So I'm very big with people on self-care, 
but that doesn't mean sort of you know going off to a spa or to your man cave for, you know for a day or for half a day. What work has worked for me? What I've had to, is building in something every day. So it's something small and achievable. And it's things like okay, you might play five minutes on it with a game on your phone, or you might sort of make sure that you have a hot cup of tea, you know, once that day, or maybe you know. It's it's going to the toilet without being disturbed, you know. They're little, they're just little things. So it's just trying to um, just to find something for you, and it could just be five minutes, but that gets you in the headspace that this is for me. Yeah. And it might be you have to wait until the kids are in bed if they go to bed, or it might be that it's your shower in the morning if you can get one is that time for you. But it's really just a lot of the time it's looking at time differently and going in a way I don't have a lot of it, but you know what, I am going to prioritise me for these five minutes. Do you know what I mean? So it's really just a a different point of view that way. You know, and I think it's also, you know, facing up to your fears, which is a big one. Um, I was terrified in the beginning, particularly because my son has a vision impairment as well as autism, to go, okay, well, how, you know, is he going to ever live by himself? Do you know what I mean? So I had all these fears of the future. And I had to realise that back when he was four, when he was diagnosed, those I'm never going to have those answers. And it took me a while, so I had to actually in a way, compartmentalise some of those fears because the internal pressures that we put on ourselves as parents and carers is just phenomenal. So we have so many expectations we're not even aware of half the time. And so that adds extra pressure. So it's just sort of trying to be aware of of what's driving us and, and you know, and just trying to find those small little wins during the day. And that helps going forward. So, I mean, I don't have any, you know, any silver bullet, unfortunately, but I really think that, just trying to approach things a little bit differently and know they will, you know, things are going to change. And our kids, regardless of diagnosis, you know, they will have a trajectory of, of progress. Do you know what I mean? It may not be the same progress that, you know, are in all the milestone books, etc. But our kids will all progress in some way. And even if they, they never, you know, they, they, they're never verbal, you know, we will find ways to communicate and, and they will find ways to communicate and we'll work through that. So I think it's just really understanding sort of, um, yourself giving yourself that time, but also, um, yeah, just being being mindful of, of, of it all as a journey, I guess, <laughs> if See, that makes sense. I actually think you did produce a silver bullet, and I think that is something people often forget or maybe hide because they don't want to go there, and that is the silver bullet being honest and realistic. If you have an autistic child, maybe more, and for goodness sakes, you've got a you've got a couple. Congratulations! I'm sure they'll change the world. But the fact of the matter is, don't hide it. It's different to parenting neurotypical kids. We have to be realistic, and that's what yes. that's what my wife and I would definitely lose sight of. For goodness sakes, guys, stop hiding in the corner. There's no elephant in the corner. You you are you. And it might be harder than normal. Okay. I think I've learned something from what you've said that's really important. Instead of me being whingy and whiny, keep in mind too, I'm autistic, that I can't spend two hours in the study working on a podcast. I've got to do it over 5, 10, 15, 20 minute increments over a week, right? You just see what I'm saying? But I really want to do it. And all my brain's thinking is, please, I'm so resentful. I can't just go and do this. I should just say, look, if I can get 5, 10, 15 minutes to take a hot coffee into the study, drink my only hot coffee for the year, and uh, <laughs> and you know and work and you know work on editing a podcast. Of course, yours won't need editing because it's because it's, it's great. Uh, that's a win when I when when all I'm thinking is that's not a win. But you're saying no, no, hang on, that is a win because you are parenting people who uh, see the world differently and react to the world differently. And I think parents listening, me and my wife included, will take that as a silver bullet. So I think being honest and realistic, just stop trying to make it normal. It's not, it's not normal. That, yep. And that, that is the big thing and that's what I talk to parents all the time because we put all these, um, so many people, you know, who, you know, when they talk about Christmas and, and all the hassles about having to travel to families and to do whatever, I wrote a post a, a, a year or so back saying, you know, do what works for your family. So we are so, you know, trained to, you know, to try and, and live life in a particular way. We have found so much happiness and it's been so much easier when we've gone, you know what, We live differently. We have slower lives. We don't do much on the weekend. We don't go out very much at all with our kids Hmm. because we know they need the weekends to rest and recover after the week and they need it to to get ready for the the week to come. So we've accepted that, you know, our whole family lives differently and instead of sort of being, you know, resentful of that or being, you know, um, going, oh, gosh, that makes us look different, we've we've learned to embrace it. But it does take time, Hmm. you know, and 
And it's going to take time to work out what will work for your family. Do you know what I mean? And what's actually going to work for you, you know, as a family unit and how, you know, all the different elements. My my youngest, so we've got three children. So my youngest, who always misses out, unfortunately, sorry, um, she, she doesn't have a diagnosis or a label. And, you know, she is neurotypical. And... Sometimes, you know, she, she does have different needs and sometimes, you know, balancing those needs to we've got to try and, and work that out as a family. So it's, I think the big takeaway for me was the fact when I was able to accept, you know what, my family life, life looks differently. We don't go out to parties. If we do, we go out, we, we set a limit of two hours because that's as long as any of us are going to be able to cope yeah. um, before things get rushed So I, and, 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 you know, difficult. So I think it is just being, you know what, okay, let's be honest and realistic. You know, our life doesn't have to look like everyone else's life. And once we stop trying to measure ourselves against our friends and family and, and neurotypical families, et cetera, it really starts taking a lot of that pressure off. Yes, absolutely. No, some great stuff there. People should rewind that and listen to that whole answer to, the, to that question. And, and in the end, I think we have to be honest that you know autistic people and parents and carers have to both agree that it's not the one or the other that deserves the things that they need to get through life. It's both parents, neurotypical mm. parents. They also will reach their limit. So it's not all just about an autistic child or autistic adult reaching their limit. Of course, that's important, but you have to you have to factor in both sides and to make sure everyone can just uh, settle themselves down is do you want equality or not? So let's move on. Uh, <laughs> next, uh, next topic is school. Now, my young autistic son just started primary school in a mainstream school. He's doing fantastically so far. So we are, look, to be honest with you, if, if I'm telling you the truth, the truth is we are shocked. Okay, Kirsty, we're not, we're not happy. We're shocked that he's doing so well. But, but we're, we are happy. I'm with you. I would be the same. <laughs> yeah, but we know, we know that mainstream schools can present barriers for autistic kids to realise their full potential, which, frankly, I'm quite, I'm quite worried about and, and a little bit scared about because mm. I know my son is phenomenal, but he just, is, just works differently. And I know that because mm. I'm the same. But how do you assist parents, educators, all the kind of stakeholders around education in getting the best possible outcomes for autistic kids? Because I'm assuming it must be such a battle. Yes. (laughs) Short answer, yes. Um, And I think it's always going to be a battle because in the end where our, you know, our kids, the system, the education system particularly, you know, isn't made for the needs of our kids. But more importantly, it's, I don't think it's, it's relevant any longer for most kids, do you know what I mean? It doesn't matter what a diagnosis or what their experience is. I think um, the school system as it is will, will have to sort of change, And but that's another topic. But what I try and do, um, I suppose, because I, I started writing my blog back in 2011, so we've been recounting, that was the year that my son transferred started his transition he was in aspect originally in an aspect autism school and then he he moved across in the mainstream so that was terrifying for us but what we needed to do as parents is really to to understand the system to understand things like you know discipline policies and and to set up really positive relationships to the school and I go and talk to to do talks with parents now to explain you know it's all about relationship management I think a lot of the time with schools it makes sense to create a relationship and to do what you can before anything, you know, happens or goes wrong. Because if you have a rapport and if you've got an existing relationship, it's so much easier to have the difficult conversations. It's so much easier to be able to go in there and, and say, look, you know, can we try this approach with our child? I think going into it as, you know, realising and working as equal partners with a school, every parent has so much knowledge that the school could learn from. Some schools are better at sort of accepting that knowledge than others. But I think in the end, it's really about having those working relationships. I talk to parents and and I talk about having difficult conversations. So one of the approaches that I do with that is to actually approach the conversation, try and approach it with an open mind and try and approach it without dreading it, which is so difficult. (laughs) But it makes such a difference to the outcome and the way that you approach and the language you use in the conversation. And so that's the main thing for parents. It's really just trying to go in strategically to the school, making those relationships, and then that makes it so much easier. And sort of understanding and suggesting things that might be left field. The school sometimes can get caught up in, and, and quite rightly so, they've got a range of legislation and guidelines and things like oh and etc. they've got to deal with. But I think if we can come in and go in very solution-oriented, so going in and saying, look, this might be a bit of an issue, but hey, have you considered this? That goes a long way to establishing a good relationship and, and leading to better outcomes for kids in schools. And on the other side of it, I go out and do professional development and information sessions for providers, including schools and disability service providers. And I'm really trying to get them to understand the parent experience because it's very difficult and they might see 
difficult behaviours and there's actually courses out there about how to deal with difficult parents and it just makes my skin crawl because we're not difficult. <laughs> we're actually just asking and we're trying to advocate the best way we can. So on the other hand, while I teach parents how to actually sort of create those relationships and use relationship management techniques to navigate the school system, on the other hand, I'm trying to go out to schools. I'm actually going to do a session next week with one of my local schools talking to them about this is what's actually happening. You're seeing this behaviour, but this is what potentially might be driving that behaviour. Because it's funny enough, I know you've probably done this most of us, we're always told when we go to therapies and our kids, behaviour is communication. But it's really funny how once you turn 18, that doesn't seem to be the same case. So <laughs> I'm really just trying to get people to understand, you know what, let's see past what's actually being said and what's actually being done and try and get some common ground and, and try to, to, you know, just to be nice <laughs> to people yes. and, you know, accept that there are different experiences, they're both valid, how can we move forward to get a, a positive outcome for everyone? Fantastic. Well, as an autistic uh, adult and dad with an autistic son and a neurotypical son and obviously my extremely patient wife, we love travelling, but we do find it extremely challenging it really is in, incredibly challenging traveling but we just keep doing it for a couple of reasons one we love it and two because we know even though it doesn't seem enjoyable when it's happening when we get back we know the effects of it is positive so what's your approach to traveling with autistic family members and what do you think the benefits of it are well first off i'm a bit with you we we love traveling but it can be i think challenging the polite <laughs> for it sometimes <laughs> We started out small with travels. So we used to do caravan parks. We go to the same one and, and that allowed kids to do, you know, jumping pillows and, 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 you know, find their sensory needs. And then we moved on to, um, you know, more elaborate things. But our approach pretty much is we do what we call the four Ps, which is planning. So when we plan a holiday, we plan it with the whole family in mind. It's not just, you know, there's no point in planning a lazy vacation to Bali or Fiji because that's not going to happen. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. so, you know, we're not going to be able to sit on sun decks, that's sun yeah. chairs and stuff. That's a, not a shopping holiday. <laughs> yeah. So the preparation, which is the second T, is, is preparing what it's going to work for us as a family. Then we pack everything because if we don't pack a charger to go with the iPad and stuff, that's just all kinds of nasty. So we um, so we, we pack with purpose. So we go, okay, what do we need? And we'll take some sensory things for the kids, that sort of thing. But the biggest thing is persevering. Yeah. And I think even if you have a less than positive experience in travel, you need to keep trying because it's going to take time for you all to find what works for you. And to be honest, probably the biggest part is for us as parents is to be prepared with our mindset to go, you know what, this is going to be hard. It's probably going to be worse than it is at home initially, but we need to give it a go and we need to be in a spot where we've got plans A, B, C, D, that sort of thing, so that we're actually got some, we use flexible thinking and some rational thinking to go, you know, what's the risk of so-and-so happening? It might actually be a very low risk of that happening, but we'll prepare for it anyway. So it's really just being realistic. And the other things that, that we do specifically and what we've found is we do social stories. So our kids will have a book each where it tells them where we're going, how long we're staying there, some of the things we might do. So it really gives that, it has a calendar, all that sort of stuff, maps it visually and sort of reassures them what's happening. So it's really finding activities that they will enjoy, but most importantly is, is addressing their sensory needs. And so, you know, having sort of headphones if it's too loud. Um, yep. You know, that sort of thing. We've got weighted lap blankets and stuff for them. So it's really just thinking, how can we address the anxiety? Because it's really, in this case, it's that anxiety and that, you know, fear of change and, and sort of the, the lack of routine. All of that stuff, you know, comes together to, to make things a little bit harder. But if you can do what you can to provide that reassurance and sense of safety, it does get better. And we've had some fantastic holidays using those those approaches. And it's great advice. And it's something I think we'll definitely use. And in some of those things we've tried, you know, you say perseverance as in keep going on holidays. Well, for us, we've had to adopt perseverance within a holiday as in let's not uh, oh, quit. Yeah. yeah, let's not quit, pack up and go home early. Let's just persevere. And, you know, by the yeah, end. Yeah, and that's what I mean too. Exactly. Um, we went to New Zealand and our bag got lost. And it was the kids' bags with the kids' clothes. Oh, it was no. terrible. This first 24-hour period was like the worst. We had, a, we had a tour go wrong. We had a car that didn't come with a car seat. 
honestly, everything that could go wrong went wrong. And <laughs> we wanted to go home. Like I was like here going, oh my God, I just want to, this is not going to work. It was a first overseas holiday. But, and, and, you know, when you're in the middle of a discount clothing store at the airport precinct at Auckland and your son is losing it because yeah. he wants his clothes, not the clothes that you're buying. Do you know what I mean? It was, yeah. it was intense. But we had to go, you know what, it's, we've got to work through it. You know, and obviously there was a money investment here. <laughs> we didn't, you know, we couldn't just go back. And the, what happened to us in that particular vacation was the fact that once our expectation went to zero, because after that point, geez, you know, we we're ready for the next thing to hit us. Yeah. It actually ended up being the best holiday <laughs> because our expectations were zero at that point. And so, and everything got better after that. So I think it is, yeah, it's having that perseverance to go, you know what, it could be nasty, things might go wrong and let's face it on holidays, something will always go wrong. That's yes. just a given. It's being prepared for that and, and being and going in with a mindset, okay, well what am I gonna do? How am I gonna solve it rather than how is it how am I gonna let it wreck our whole sort of holiday? Yeah. Expectations is a big thing. I think if we just remove all the expectations, it's okay oh. if if a large portion of the holiday is still basically on the couch watching T V, you're still somewhere else, you can still go you can still go and have fun and just, just take away those expectations of prior holidays <laughs> when you were young and free. Before we go, I know we've talked about positive parenting and I know I've kind of shared from our point of view in that kind of eye of the storm I really at the moment see it as you know hard exhausting overwhelming we really are just doing the basics so adopting a positive parenting approach even though it seemed amazing you know frankly can be quite quite hard when you don't really know you know which way is up and which way is down I think we we have to go for this positive parenting thing because it really comes into alignment with the strengths and interest based approach to autism mm-hmm. as opposed to the deficit based approach. But for those people listening, like myself, what do you have? What kind of words of advice can you tell parents and carers? How can they kind of take a more positive mindset? Probably the biggest thing that helped me was making connections, and I think it's really important because sometimes our families don't understand, you know, what's what's going on. Um, or, you know, just what pressure we're under. I think one of the best things I ever did, and I still actually have coffee once a week with a friend of mine, and her um, daughter went to, to the same aspect class as my son did. And so, you know, 10 years down the track, we still get together. But it's just finding those connections with people who get it, you know, and building your own village. Yep. Um, so our families may not get it, but you know what, you may have other people at, at school. And so, as I said, that was an aspect. But even at mainstream, I've been able to, um, you know, connect with other parents who do go through similar challenges to us. And I think if you've got someone that you can actually just talk to, because sometimes when you're in the middle of it, it's so difficult. Everything seems too hard and it's too much and there is no light at the end of the tunnel. But being able to just even just vent, you know, even just say things out to someone and other options that I give to people or I suggest is to write things down, write down the good and the bad things. Yep. If you write down the good things, that helps you. You know, if you challenge yourself to do one, you know, to, to find one positive each day, that actually will slowly change your mindset. So you'll be able to look back and go, oh, you know what, I did go to the toilet without being interrupted that day. <laughs> or, okay, yep, yeah, I did get that hot cup. Or, you know, I was able to do 20 minutes of my podcasting today or whatever the, the case may be. And it's equally as important to write down the things that you're scared of, the things that might worry you. Because sometimes, and I found that writing things down puts them in black and white. And some sometimes the power they have over you is gone because you've released them from your mind. They're no longer sort of dwelling there yeah. um, with the, quite the same manner. So I think it's really making those connections it's being honest with yourself and, and sort of, you know, and trying to find those positives. But equally, don't just ignore, because I'm not about toxic positivity. I don't say to people, I'll put a smile on your face and everything's going to be cool and just pretend, you know, fake it till you make it. That's not what this is. Being positive and what I've had to do is actually doing the hard yards. It's actually yeah. being honest with yourself. It's accepting that, yep, this situation might be not be what you chose um, and it might not be what you expected as a parent. But let's move forward, and, and and in the end, I couldn't, I can't not try and do the best for my kids. Do you know what I mean? And and I'm not saying that no one does, but that's really what drove me. It's like you know what, I want to give them the best chance and the best, and the only way to really do that is to try and move past the barriers and to try and see more positively. And then that's when the opportunities are there. Once you see them then you can try and encourage other people to see them as well. And hopefully we've been able to, to do that over the years. And, and now my kids are in a quite a positive position. And I'm hoping that's because of some of the work that we did in, you know, we did all those years when we were in the eye of the storm. <laughs> that's right. Well, it, it really is fantastic advice, invaluable advice for parents and carers of autistic kids. 
What's the website if people want to uh, learn more about what you do? Yep, my website is kirstyrussell.com.au and I also have a Facebook page called Inclusive Parenting and that's where I share things every day, of stuff that I find around resources, links, and I try and help people, yeah, find the positives, but also find ways around particular challenges and try to create that community for those people who may not immediately have a village around them. So hopefully that will help people if they want to take that first step to looking at things more positively. Great chat, Kirsty. I've really enjoyed it. No, thank you so much. I've appreciated the time and, and talking to you as well. My guest was advocate, public speaker, consultant, and parent of two autistic children, Kirsty Russell. A Different Brilliant with Orion Kelly. No two autistic people are the same. An Aspect podcast focusing on the strengths, interests and aspirations of the autistic community. And thank you so much for listening to A Different Brilliant. I appreciate it and I hope this episode has inspired, informed and entertained you. If the episode has resonated with you, please share it with your family and friends so we can reach more people And if you'd like to continue the conversation, just like the Aspect page on Facebook or visit autismspectrum.org.au. You're also welcome to send me a message via my website, orionkelly.com.au. A Different Brilliant is an Aspect podcast focusing on the strengths, interests and aspirations of the autistic community. Executive producers are Lisa Cassidy and Dr. Tom Tutton. I'm Orion Kelly and I look forward to celebrating the neurodiversity of autistic people and providing a voice for the autistic community on the next episode of A Different Brilliant. Thanks for listening to A Different Brilliant with Orion Kelly, an Aspect podcast on the strengths, interests and aspirations of the autistic community. Our door is open anytime, so like the Aspect page on Facebook or visit autismspectrum.org.au. My aim, make the world a better place for autistic people.